Um, and so I, I sort of look at this talk as like a bookend you know, to, to the talk I, I gave before because I feel like I knew some things and I had some ideas then. Um, but um, I've been able to build on it, you know? And uh, part, part of building on it um, is having a, a variety of experiences. I'm just gonna take two seconds just to acknowledge uh, some folks in the room. Um, somewhere back, all my uh, folks who I studied this summer with uh, at Middlebury. Um, who are much, you know, who are some of the, you know, the most um, uh, learned uh, uh, Americans I have ever encountered in the French language. Uh, it was an absolutely, actually, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Middlebury's program, but you go away for seven weeks and you are, oh, and there's Bill back there too, okay, he's now with the crowd, okay. Um, <laughs> but you're basically barred for seven weeks uh, from speaking uh, English. So this, this cover story had come out, a case for reparations, and, you know, I was, you know, you know, feeling all hot and intelligent and everywhere I went. He said, God, that guy's really smart. He's the smartest guy I've ever seen. God, you know, I was getting all this praise, right, going on all these TV shows and everything. And then you get up into the wilds of Vermont, right? <laughs> and you're reduced to a five-year-old. I mean, really just, you know, a, a five-year-old. And so um, most of the folks who are here tonight uh, were, were master students with maybe one or two exceptions, I think, back there. Um, and they were just so kind and so giving, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, being willing to uh, tolerate uh, mon français <laughs> and mon niveau. Um, and so it was just, it was, it, was, it was an excellent, excellent experience. And it was like um, a chance to just allow everything I was thinking about at that point in time to just marinate for a second, you know, because I think that's good. And then, you know, co come back to it again. And, and it's continued, right? You know, because here I am. You know, I, I come back here uh, to Paris, and I was so looking forward to coming back. All my middle, Middlebury friends were posting these pictures of all the beautiful things they were doing in Paris, you know, and I was, you know, just jealous and, you know, couldn't wait to get back. And you know, I was joking the other night, the plane landed, and I got into the taxi, you know, and it was like, you know, this woman who I'd been in love with, and I was like, baby, I'm back, and I'm never going to leave you again. I promise you, I love you. I adore you. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, I got, I got in my apartment, you know, and the, uh, the person who, you know, is written to me was showing me around the apartment. She was like, you know, is everything, you know, as, as you would want in the apartment doesn't have like a doorknob on it. It's kind of cold. But I was like, man, I'm in Paris. You know, what else? You know, you could have put me in a garbage bin. I would have been okay. That, that was Sunday, right? And I think um, the, the attack happened Wednesday. Um, and I had another experience that I, I probably shouldn't talk about because I don't want to, you know, bring it down too much. But um, Wednesday, the, the, the attack happened, right? And even after the attack happened, I had come here to write this book, and I said, you know what, I'm going to zone in. I'm here to do this book. I'm not going to deal with this. I'm just going to act like this didn't happen. This is what I was actually telling myself, right? That lasted for about one day. It's a good, you know, a good day. And then, you know, I, I was caught up in it. And so, you know, it, it's been a situation now, whereas, you know, over the summer, it was a very sort of classroom environment, somewhat out of the classroom environment where I've studied the language. But, you know, for the past week, I've been, like, thrown into these environments. Uh, where, you know, I, I have to use it. I have to find some way to, you know, make it useful. And um, it's been very interesting to use the language as part of an actual investigation, as a lived thing. Today I was sitting with a couple of journalists uh, from over at Liberation, and uh, uh, one, one of the guys was, uh, was, was Megabon, and, you know, just getting his perspective. You know, and he didn't really speak English, right? So we're sitting there, right? I mean, one of the journalists, other journalists, thank God, did and was able to help out. But getting his perspective on, on Je suis Charlie, you know, and the whole movement and the manifestation was just absolutely, absolutely fascinating. And so um, all of this really is, is, is about education. You know, it really is, you know, my, my chance, you know, uh, uh, to, to, to be that, that autodidact again. And the case for reparations really, really started out like that for me. I mean, it, it was not, um, I was not a longtime advocate of reparations. That was not, you know, how, how I came to it. Um, before I get into that, though, I just, you know, I, I, I um, I'm a huge fan of James Baldwin. I, I just adore James Baldwin. Um, that has nothing to do with my, you know, séjour here uh, in, in France. It really just so happens that it's the same thing. I did not come here out of any sort of inspiration for James, from James Baldwin, but I, I adore him. Every time, you know, um, people, when I get back, they always say, oh, you were in Paris. Like James Baldwin, like James Baldwin. <laughs> not like James Baldwin. Everything else like James Baldwin, but not because of that. Um, but anyway, he has this uh, passage that I, I find myself going back to over and over again. That I think you know we'll set the tone for this talk tonight. Um, Baldwin is is is, uh, is at the beginning of, of the fire next time, and he's writing his nephew, and you know during the 1960s and all the tumult of the 60s, and he's trying to explain them. He's basically making the case for integration and making the case for nonviolence and laying out the path that that, that his nephew really has to embrace. And he takes a, a brief moment within that to just uh, 
let his nephew know something about the country he's living in. And at this point, he's talking about where white America is in their, in their history. Um, they are, in effect, still trapped in a history which they do not understand. And until they understand it, they cannot be released from it. They have had to believe for many years and for innumerable reasons that black men are inferior to white men. Many of them, indeed, know better. But as you will discover, people find it very difficult to act on what they know. To act is to be committed, and to be committed is to be in danger. In this case, the danger in the minds of most white Americans is the loss of their identity. Try to imagine how you would feel if you woke up one morning to find the sun shining and all the stars aflame. You would be frightened because it is out of the order of nature. Any upheaval in the universe is terrifying because it so profoundly attacks one's sense of one's own reality. Well, the black man has functioned in the white man's world as a fixed star, as an immovable pillar. As he moves out of his place, heaven and earth are shaken to their foundation. I've always thought it was like such a, a beautiful passage, and it's grown beautiful uh, um, to me more over the years because I think in many ways, like, it sounds like kind of just, you know, highfalutin and, and, and rhetorical. Uh, but one of the things that, you know, I, I discovered in, the, in researching the case for reparation that I continue to rediscover, frankly, even here, you know, looking at, at, at the events of, of the past week, um, is how, you know, racism, bigotry, and perhaps this can be extended to, you know, all the isms that we talk about and all the phobias we talk about, how they have actual functions within a society. Um, Americans you know, uh, uh, I like to think of racism as, 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 as irrational, and white supremacy as, as, as irrational. It's kind of out of place. It's something that we can be educated out of. We, we, we call it uh, a disease of the heart. That's how we talk about it. If we could all just be nicer to each other, everything would, 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 uh, would be better. Uh, I, I think there's a, a reason why uh, the most quoted, you know, passage probably Martin Luther King ever uttered is, you know, from, I, you know, the I have a dream speech. You know, he has a dream that, you know, Black girls and white girls will hold hands together. I'm sorry, I'm mangling Martin Luther King, and I've heard it so much. Um, but basically, that everybody will join together and hold hands. Love, 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 love. This goes back to uh, you know one of the most famous uh, documents uh, in sociology uh, published. Hey, Lynn Brown. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, one of the most famous documents published uh, in, so in sociology, uh, in the literature, uh, by Gunnar Myrtle, The American Dilemma. And Gunnar Myrtle is obsessed with the hearts of white people. If the hearts of white people can be healed, then the world can be healed, or at least America can be healed. And we can get over this racism thing. And, and Baldwin is saying something much, much more profound. Then the problem is not you know, that, that white people are mean to black people. He is saying that black people in their subjugated place in America actually serve a function. They actually give identity to white people. And not just identity, you know, um, not just identity in the sense of, you know, you get to say I am white, but something bigger than that, material things. So the case for reparations uh, proceeds from, from the idea in the article that racism is an actual, you know, functioning system, that it's, uh, 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 um, that it can't be removed from American history, that you, if you don't understand the African-American struggle, uh, that you're not really understanding America and how it functions and, you know, all of its, you know, uh, uh, broader challenges. You know, I, I was, went through probably about three years at the Atlantic uh, when I first got there. And there all these sort of arguments and, you know, ways that we twist ourselves in knots trying to understand how can it be that African Americans occupy basically the bottom position right there with Native Americans of almost every socioeconomic statistic uh, uh, in America. I was reading up a little while ago. I think the only thing we don't occupy the body is like suicide and drunk driving. Those are the two. <laughs> you know, for some reason, black people are not at the bottom of those two. I'm not sure why, <laughs> but but inevitably, by some statistical quirk, we are not. And and we go through, you know, it, you know, we go through all of these, you know, arguments, and we say, well, is it class? Is it that you know a certain you know percentage of, of black people are poor? Is it culture is it that African Americans have certain cultural traditions? Uh, in the 1960s, uh, Patrick Moynihan said, well, well it's, uh, it's a, a, a matriarchy. It's the fact that black women have too much power uh, in African American families. We go through all of these reasons. And, and, and the point I try to make, if not explicitly, but definitely was in the back of my mind, was that if an alien uh, came to the planet Earth and you know, looked at all of these statistics, it was asked to assess the history of the United States and its treatment to African Americans. The place of African Americans in America would not be particularly mysterious at all. 
You know, uh, uh, the alien would look at this and say, mm, this probably makes sense. You know, and, and I think like even in writing the case, it was the idea of having to go back through all of that history um, and having to pull it all together, you know, in a way that it was, it was already all there. And yet, I think we, we, we don't realize it. This notion that Baldwin is talking about, about African-Americans being central to white identity begins at, at, at the start of our country. And I said this in the last lecture, but 1619 African-Americans uh, arrive in America. Uh, but notions of race are not immediate cl immediately clear and are not immediately there. There are other people working, you know, with them there, you know, as, you know, indentured servants uh, who were there who also, you know, experienced some degree of unfreedom. And these people mix and they, you know, they party together and they sleep together and they actually rebel together. And they do all sorts of, you know, things that people do when they, you know, meet in, in a particular place. But if you follow the laws, if you look at the laws as they're enacted in a colony like Virginia or, or throughout, you know, colonial America, what you'll find is the law gradually separating black from white and gradually awarding privileges uh, to uh, uh, white people and stripping privileges from black people. One of the things I think that we, we have to, you know, to understand is, is you have to like, think of black people um, not just as, as, as a group of people who have a different shade, uh, which is not even always true, but who have a different shade than white people, but as uh, America's quintessential criminal class. And so if you look at you know, these laws, what you see is basic things um, that most of us would take for granted being criminalized. The primary way, I mean, we were all taught this, to we were all taught this in elementary school. But, but like the primary way, uh, if you were in America in the 17th or the 18th or into the 19th century, that you elevated yourself was you learned how to read. And yet learning how to read was effectively a criminal act for slaves. Um, there were slave codes all through Virginia with various things, talking too loud, black people uh, uh, getting in, in, in a group, you know, too many of them uh, talking secretly raising your voice or speaking in an uncouth way around a, a, a white woman, a raft of things that were just criminalized. Somebody <laughs> takes your child and puts your child uh, uh, up for sale and you, you know, do as any human would do. You try to, you attempt to stop that sale and you are a criminal. Uh, in his book, Race, Crime, and Law, Randall Kennedy says in 1860, there was something like 70 laws on the books for which African Americans could get the death penalty. And there was one law on the book for which white people could get the death penalty. Uh, this, this is a criminal class. When I mean, you think about somebody like Harriet Tubman, right, and the way Harriet Tubman was addressed in that time. Now, Harriet Tubman is on stamps and everything in America and in monuments, and everybody loves me. Mean, even in places where there are no black people, everybody loves to talk about Harriet Tubman. But this avoids the essential fact that Harriet Tubman was a criminal within her own time. Uh, Harriet Tubman was literally a thief of her own body. Her body was property to somebody else, and she stole it. It was against the law, you know. And had they caught her, and had they caught her, they would have took her to court for stealing her own body. In addition to that, in addition to that, she was not just a thief of her own body; she was a thief of other people's bodies. Black people did not, you know, enjoy the right to their own bodies as property. She's a criminal. She's outside. They had wanted posters for her. She was like, they wanted posters for Jesse James. And it's, it's an obvious thing, you know, when you think about it. But, you know, I don't think we are always, you know, put two and two together. If you think about, like, the career of Martin Luther King, you know, this is the era we have Selma out and everybody, you know, is I saw um, was the governor of Georgia talking about they getting ready to build this big monument for Martin Luther King. But Martin Luther King was considered a criminal for most of his adult life and most of his activist life in the South. He was not regarded as a saint. He was outside of the law. And so I think, like, once you can understand that, once you can understand black people being bracketed off into a separate class, then you can get, like, what the purpose of that. We, we again, we talk about uh, uh, slavery. And we talk about what follows slavery. We talk about Jim Crow. We talk about housing, you know, which, which my case is rooted in. And, and again, it's discussed in this kind of um, overly sentimental, overly, you know, not overly, over, overly sentimental and melodramatic way uh, that becomes a kind of pageantry of suffering. You know, it focuses on the, the meanness of individual, the, partic the particular evil acts. But what people don't understand is that uh, slavery in America occupied a necessary economic space. So I, I went on a, 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 um, a binge, like, uh, uh, in, in uh, I guess, about three or four years ago, where I got really, really interested in civil rights, reading everything about the Civil War. And um, one of the things that, that immediately surprised me, because going in, I didn't really know too much about it. Civil War wasn't really taught to me. You know, even in a, you know, a school that was very much concerned with African American history. But you read the stats, and you see like 600,000 people die, right? 
and you try to understand like how that happens and, and why that happens. Well, African Americans in their time, taken together as a class, worth something like $3.5 billion as property. And $3.5 billion in 1860 is more than all of the nascent factories, it's more than all the shipyards, it's more than all the banks, it's all the property, all the assets, all the productive capacity that America had at that point in 1860. You put it together, you put it in a pile over here, and then you put enslaved black people over here, black people were worth more as property. Once you understand that, you can start to understand the sort of numbers. And not just that, because like as any sort of economic institution, economic institutions don't stay as just money. They become social you know, uh, institutions. We, we don't have uh, enslavement uh, in, in America today as, as, a, as a legal you know, sort of institution like we did before. But the closest I can get to it, the closest I can get to it, and this is not quite right, but this is the closest I can get to it. You, you should think about enslavement working as a, as a social institution in much the same way you should think about home ownership working. So home ownership isn't just the fact that you buy your house. You buy your house and now you enter into a different class of people. And slave ownership was much the same way in the South. You entered into a different class of people once you owned uh, a human being. Uh, Slaveholders published uh, journals like the Bose Review. And in the Bose Review, if you read like back archive copies, you can find slaveholders trading tips on how they can wring the most work out of slaves. If you were in a state like uh, Mississippi or South Carolina, whether you own slaves or not, if you were a, a white male of military age, you were impressed into the slave patrols. You know, just going back to this notion of African Americans being uh, a criminal class, the roots of Southern police are in the slave patrols. That's the first, you know, organized uh, Southern police is to uh, make sure African Americans are not escaping. So you can see it becoming, you know, like just the same way that, you know, maybe homeowners would get together to discuss, you know, putting on a, a new deck on their house or redoing, you know, adding a third, you know, uh, a, a bedroom. I don't own a home. I don't know what you guys uh, discuss. <laughs> but I know that you discuss certain things. I see the magazines on the racks. I know y'all are talking about something that, you know, I'm outside of. But, but in much the same way, you know, home ownership becomes a social glue, right? You know, you live on the block, you join the block association, you know, you go back and forth. And, 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 and slaveholding <clears throat> worked the same way. And then after that, after the Civil War, white supremacy continued to work the same way. Because the fact of the matter, I mean, this, this part won't be news to anybody, but you know, if you were uh, white and you were in America, no matter how low you were, you could never, by law, in fact, never by law sink as low as any black person. And this made you a kind of broad aristocracy. John Calhoun has this quote, and I don't have the exact quote on me, but he's talking about you know, what makes the slave system uh, superior uh, to, to the free labor, labor system in the South. And he basically says, you know, in the South we have this system where, you know, the difference is not between rich and poor, but between black and white. You know, and all who are white are automatically of the same class. You know, and all who are black are automatically of a lower class. So, you know, one of the things I wanted people to get in this, in, in, in this work is that racism is not just a matter of you not being nice to me. You know, it's an indivisible portion of why America works the way it works. It, 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 uh, it's essential to how we were able to hold ourselves together after the Civil War. And, you know, had we, I was, I was you know, it was uh, very fortunate to be on the Colbert Show. And he was saying, well, you know, you're always talking about slavery, you're always talking about slavery. And I said, listen, you can make a case for reparations and just say everything after 1860. Because it's not like African Americans afterwards, you know, after we had fought this war, after all of these people had died. You know, it was not like after that we said, okay, everybody's equal. <laughs> you know, everything's going to be okay now. You had 100 years of Jim Crow. You know, you had, you know, in, in the South, you had African Americans being stripped of the right to vote. And again, I think, you know, like when we think about the vote, we think about this as, as a sort of sentimental thing that you do, like to be a good, a good citizen, you know, you go, you cast your vote. And there's all this kind of imagery that goes, you know, with it. If you're in other countries, there's this imagery of holding up these fingers and, you know, that, 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 you know, kind of overpowers the fact of what a vote is. If you are in Mississippi, lacking the right to vote means that you lack the right to determine what happens with your tax dollars. It means that you, you know, are subject to all the laws and all the penalties and all the fiduciary responsibilities of any other citizen who's living uh, 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 in Mississippi, and yet you can't get the same out of it. So this is real. So are women. Okay. Can I can I finish talking now? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this, is, this assumes very, 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 very real things, you know? So we think about like the sit-ins, you know, down south and everything, but if you're not part of society, if you can't vote, if you're under Jim Crow, 
You are paying taxes for swimming pools that you can't swim in. You're paying taxes for libraries that you can't borrow books out of. You're paying taxes to erect an entire university system that by law excludes you. And so what you can then begin to see is an entire systemized uh, 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 effort of plunder that you can trace back through slavery, extends through Jim Crow, and into segregation. And it wasn't much better in the North, regrettably. <clears throat> My case for re reparations is based primarily on housing, because one of the things I wanted people to understand is that this doesn't end with people's ancestors, that there are people who are alive very much today who can make a claim. <clears throat> and so the primary character in my article is uh, a gentleman by the name of Clyde Ross. And Clyde Ross was born under, in Mississippi, and he was under uh, all of the conditions. You can have that, go ahead. Oh, is that for me? Yeah. Thank you. I'm OK. Thank you. I thought you were going to take the water. <laughs> I was going to say you can have it. <laughs> um, it's a very lively crowd. Um, I didn't expect that in Paris. Um, anyway, thank you. So uh, Clyde Ross is born in Mississippi, and he's uh, you know suffering from all the sort of degradations that you know you think of with Jim Crow. Um, he comes to Chicago, and he thinks he's going to end up in, in a better position, and it looks like for a while he does. Um, he gets a decent job, you know. He you know marries this woman who he's in love with. He has these these kids, and you know he's able actually to save up enough money, <clears throat> you know, so that he can go and buy a house. And what's happening in the 1950s is you know effectively we've had this effort that began under Roosevelt. We made this decision as a country that it would be a good idea to erect a broad middle class. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to do that through home ownership. So we have the FHA, for instance, the HOLC, and we decide that the government should back loans. The government should give loans effectively, say, to banks. Uh, we'll back this on. This person you know, defaults on it. We got it covered. And so what that meant is... Before, you know, we had uh, the federal government backing loans. Before we had things like the GI Bill, you, you had a situation where basically you might need as much as 30%, you know, down to buy a home. Uh, the mortgages, you know, were longer. The interest rates were higher. And this made, possible, um, this made it possible for ordinary Americans to have access to loans in a way that had never been true in American history. Only one group really was, was kept out of that. Well, there were other groups, but the major group in this country was, was, was African Americans. And so Clyde Ross... You know, he was living, you know, uh, in a house with his brother and his brother's wife and his mother and his father. So a veteran of World War II decides that, you know, he wants to get that emblem of being an American. And he goes out and he's looking to, you know, get a loan. Like, you know, all of his other, you know, people who fought in the war, you know, with him are able to get access to loans. And he can't get loans. And he doesn't understand why. And what only came out in the 1970s was, in fact, that the government had this entire program called redlining. And what that meant was they printed up maps, and you can go and you know, do a Google. You know, as soon as you're done with this, uh, it's the most shocking document you ever want to see. But you can basically Google any major city in America and enter redlining, and you can see these maps. And what they did was they took the population of every you know, neighborhood, every downtown, like every block, and they literally drew lines around the population. And any time the population you know, uh, had, you know, it could be as few as one black person on the block, they marked that, that, that particular block off. And they marked it off in red, that's you know, the term redlining comes from. And basically, those places were ineligible for subsidized loans. African Americans going out, they didn't even understand, they didn't even know why. They just knew that they couldn't get loans. And so again, you see yourself sort of cut out of society. And then after <laughs> being excised from society, what comes after that immediately is the plunder. So Clyde Ross has this money saved up. And he's trying to find, well, I can't get a legitimate loan, so where am I going to go to? You're going to go to the illegitimate market. He got hooked up in this system called uh, contract lending. And basically, the way it worked was he thought he was buying a home. He did not get the deed. He put like the down payment down. The guy he had bought the house from sold it to him for like double as much. He put down this, you know, it's relatively for the time, huge down payment. He had essentially all the responsibilities of an owner and all the disadvantages of a renter. Because the way the contract basically worked was, you didn't get the deed into the home until you fully paid the home off. And the system was designed so that you didn't pay the home off. So they would set you know, like, like your monthly payment astronomically high. And the way the law was written in Chicago at the time, um, if you missed one month's payment, they could call in the sheriffs and basically kick you out. And so the people who were doing contract loans were basically able to cycle African-American families in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. 
Clyde Ross was one of the lucky few uh, who managed to hold on to his, onto his home. But it's estimated that in the 1950s, 85% of African Americans who bought homes in Chicago bought them on contract in this sort of fashion. Um, that is a broad taking of wealth. Because see, what you have to understand is why this is, while this is happening, there's a whole you know, other population of white people who are able to access loans and these, you know, these low interest loans you know, subsidized by the government this whole different way black people are bracketed off into this entire you know, different system. I think like that, that really like captures the challenge of it because I mean, even in talking to Clyde Ross and talking to like the African Americans who I was able to talk to who had been you know uh, cord cordoned off into the system, I was very much aware that I was actually talking to the to the survivors. Now, I was not talking to most black people because most black people went into their homes, you know, um, basically couldn't keep up the payments, were kicked out and lost their down payment and just you know they basically just got fleeced. That that was the way it meant. For most black people, Clyde Ross took like three jobs. He was working at the post office, working at Campbell's, delivering pizza. You know, he was like just one of these sort of extraordinary people. But, you know, the vast majority of us who are going to be ordinary are not going to be that way. Um, and so seeing it as, as an actual function within the city of Chicago, you know, when I went back, you know, to Lawndale, the neighborhood where, where Mr. Ross bought his home, and you start running the stats on that neighborhood, and they exist pretty much where you ex expect an African-American neighborhood to exist, you immediately begin to understand why this neighborhood never had the kind of investment that went into other neighborhoods. And this is a national system. I focused on Chicago, but redlining was a national problem uh, for African Americans. The source of this, in any sort of conversation that you know, we're going to have you know, about race in America, has to begin with wealth. Has to begin with wealth. So, the result largely, largely, but not just, largely as a result about how housing policies. We're in a, a situation in our country where for every dollar of wealth that a white family has, black people have about five cents. Um, even African Americans who manage to earn a, a decent amount of money end up living in you know, subpar neighborhoods. So there's a, a sociologist at NYU, Patrick Shock, and he's basically shown that African Americans who uh, make uh, families that make around $100,000 live in the kind of neighborhoods that white families that make about $30,000 live in. Um, the source of this is wealth. And until we you know, begin to have some sort of conversation about returning <laughs> that wealth to the place that, that, that it came from, I, I don't think we're actually having a really serious conversation uh, uh, about, about what we can do about you know, this, this chasm between the races. Yeah, I, I, I want to end with you know, just a, a few ad hoc, very, very dangerous <laughs> comments about you know, what, what I'm seeing so far. Um, here in France. And I guess I, I feel like I would be, you know, not doing my, my duty if I didn't say something about this, although I kind of don't want to say anything about it, but I think I should. Uh, I went to the Manifestation on Sunday. I've been, you know, very welcomed, you know, in, in the homes of, and, you know, at the, at, at the dinner tables of, you know, various uh, French families here in this country. And it's been very, very interesting to hear, you know, pe people talk about it. And yet, you know, at the same time, I'm reading this book by Alastair Horn. Um, oh my God, I'm a blank on the name. It's a history of the, uh, the Algerian War, basically. Um, and I could not help but notice that as he talked about, you know, the, the stereotypes, you know, uh, uh, that were held of uh, uh, Algerians in Algeria, that they sounded really, really familiar uh, about them being rapists, criminals, etc. It just it sounded really, really, really familiar. Mm -hmm. And I'm not an expert in French history, you know, uh, but I, I, I have noted over the past week uh, about how the conversation has began at a particular point. You know, one of the things I know in America, when we want to have a conversation that is advantageous uh, to the society in the short term, that unites as many people as possible, even if it's not the truest or the correct conversation, we begin the conversation at, at a particular point. You know, you know my, my hope you know, over the next few weeks while, while I'm here, um, and my hope you know, for the country in general, is that you know, the conversation will not continue to be like that, that there'll be some sort of long conversation, that history will, will start to uh, be, be talked about more. I, I just, um, I am working from a working thesis that maybe you guys aren't uh, that different from us. Um, and I'm not sure that's true yet. You know, we'll, we'll see. But it kind of feels true. Well, I start from the um, immediate proposition that their folks are different. I mean, that's, that, I, I, always, I always start from that. I mean, you have a different history. It's a different country. You know, um, it doesn't mean that that's where you ultimately end up, but I think it's actually quite dangerous to assume that things are the same. Um, I think that that actually is the uh, um, yeah. I, I just I, I'm very wary of immediately imputing 
what the African American experience is to to a country like France. France is a much older country, France, and I mean you just start there uh, than America. This, uh, uh, France doesn't have the same history of having a slave society within its borders. Within its borders is a very key key phrase there. Within its borders, the way America does. Um, so knowing, you know, proceeding from the fact that the very history of the place is different. Um, in fact, I, I would even go further and say, um, although some might dispute this, there, there is no America w without black people. Like if you got, and I mean American history, period. So if you start, okay, wherever you want to begin with America, if you want to start in the 17th century, you know, colonial America, if you want to start, you know, 1776, wherever you start, there are black people there right away. <laughs> You know what I mean? So, so black people are like, in there, there's no American identity that ever existed, ever, at any point in history that was separate from black people. So I begin with the proposition, with the thesis, you know, that, that things are, in fact, different. Um, now, I might not be correct, you know, and I'm definitely willing to be proved wrong, and you know, that's part of the reason why I'm here, you know, to hear about that. But I, I do, I try to begin, because I want to give people their own individuality. You know, I want to give people the, you know, the chance to, divine, to uh, define their society as it is, you know, and here it is. Just, it just feels... I mean, how would I feel if some French person came over to America and used that frame more immediately to analyze America? You know, that would, that would throw me off, you know? In addition to that, like, within the left, we have this <clears throat> habit of, you know, uh, comparing everything to everything else and insisting everything is like everything else. And I think, um, you know, discussion around racism on the left specifically has suffered from that. So I would not want to duplicate that. Yeah. Redlining was the invention of, of the Homeowners Own Corporation, the mm -hmm. HOLC, and one of the difficult things that liberals in America have to deal with is like Roosevelt is a huge, huge hero in the left. Uh -huh. um, this happened under the Roosevelt administration. Right, of course, yeah. um, and I mean, so I, I'll give both sides of this, okay? Um, you want to broaden home ownership. You want to, you know, broaden basically the social safety net in general for Americans, and yet a necessary and essential portion of the Roosevelt coalition was the South and South. Yeah. You know, was these, were these Democrats whose highest priority in the 1930s uh, uh, was white supremacy, period. And they, they saw no real, you know, uh, uh, disconnect, as, 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 as is true today. They saw no real disconnect at the time between a broad social safety net and being a white supremacist. They were very much willing to erect a broad social safety net as long as they could cut black people out of it. As long as it didn't threaten segregation, they were okay with that. I mean, you look at the career of somebody like uh, Theodore Bilbo, you know, senator from Mississippi, largely considered, I mean, arguably one of the most racist people to ever serve. I mean, <clears throat> Theodore Bilbo, if you read the article, I mean, literally, you know, says, I think he was doing a radio show when he's running, and he says, you know, we know how to keep the nigga from voting. You do it the night before. I mean, he's got endorsing terrorism as a sitting state senator. At the same time, at the same time, but he's Roosevelt, running. But no, 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 hold on, hold on. Let me, condone that now. Wait, wait, hold on. Let me finish. Let me, let, let me finish, though. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. At the very same time, there's a U.S. senator running in the South and telling people, I'm a strong Roosevelt man. I mean, he's using Roosevelt's name. I mean, he's, he's you know, running as a, you know, I mean, I hate to use the term liberal you know, because it doesn't have the same connotation as today. But let's say, you know, just a, a progressive person who's interested in, you know, helping, you know, poor whites. And, and largely, Solid South was found this as long as they could cut black people out. And so this was true, um, not just for homeowners, but for, you know, if you look at how the GI Bill was passed, <laughs> You know, the person who had uh, uh, the committee for the GI Bill was John Rankin. John Rankin, representative right out of Mississippi, actually used the word nigga on, on the uh, House floor. You know, just a, a straight, you know, inveterate racist. The bill was under him. The bill was under him. And the way he worked it was he made sure that when you went to uh, uh, do your interview, if you wanted to use the GI Bill, it ran through the Veterans Administration. And it ran through the local office of the Veterans Administration. So if you were in Mississippi, and you wanted to get you know, a GI Bill loan for education, you wanted to get a GI Bill loan for housing, you had to talk to that local official in Mississippi. And that was the way it's done. And, and in, fact, in fact, you can actually see very, very haunting echoes of that if you look at Obamacare. Uh -huh. Because it's localized in much the same way. And it allows people to cut you know, you know, folks out. Yeah. So redlining specifically, you know, just to get back to your question, was you know, undertaken by the homeowners loan corporation. And basically what they did was they drew up these maps. They distributed the, the maps to, to banks Banks didn't need much, you know, incentive to be racist. <laughs> you know, the banks were already racist. You know, uh, the realtors were already, you know, racist. Home ownership was was a particular uh, uh, ideal in America. You know, as, as it is today. Uh, and you know, there's a a great um, 
it's referenced in, in the piece, but there's a, there's a great pamphlet that, that's handed out uh, to the Trade Association for Realtors at that time. And they, they're listing, you know, the kind of undesirables uh, that you don't want, you know, to, to sell to in, in a white neighborhood. And they list, you know, like, you know, a madam who's running a whole house, you know, uh, a pimp. And then they just randomly list a black man who has gotten above his, you know, means and thinks he has the right to, 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 to batter himself. I mean, that's actually, you know, in their, in their pamphlet. So you, are, you, know, you have a kind of systematic race, racist thing there, but then it gets the imprimatur of the federal government through these maps. You know, and this lasted in, into the 1960s. I mean, it really didn't. I mean, there's some arguments that it didn't end, that it, that it never ended, but didn't really end you know, by, by you know, federal law until the 1968 housing bill. This had huge, huge consequences for wealth accumulation for African Americans. No, no, not at all, not at all. And frankly, I just, I don't think, <laughs> No, I think, it, I think it's very possible. I think it's very, very possible. And I think it's very, very possible because, first of all, the first thing is, well, let me go through why it's possible, and then I'll talk to you why I don't have a model right now. Um, it's possible because we did it before. I mean, let's, let's just start there. You know, um, we did it, first of all, we did it with African Americans. Very, very few people know this, but several, you know, before, say before like the 1830s, before the antebellum South, several people, you know, granted reparations who were... Uh, 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 slaveholders. George Washington, when he dies, he says in his, in his, in his will, you know, oh, not just yeah. free all my slaves, but make sure they're educated. You know, he leaves, you know, he's make sure that there's money set aside for them to be educated. The Quakers, you know, right after the revolution, not only do they insist that, you know, they, they you know, this got into a kind of sectarian fight, but not only do they insist that you free slaves, but they say you should give reparations. They say it's not right to just, you know, cut people loose into the world and just have them, you know, uh, 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 do whatever. So we, we have all of these examples, you know, uh, pre-1830 of white people actually giving reparations of their own private free will. Within our own history, right now within modern history, we had the fact that we gave reparations to Japanese Americans for internment. The bill was signed by Ronald Reagan. I mean, it was made possible under, under conservatives. So um, internment ends in the 1940s. Housing discrimination doesn't end until 1968. So it's not even a matter of temporal. I mean, even if you wanted to take the most mean program period of reparations, you could look at the redlining maps. You could look at the, uh, the census. You could see who lived under redline. It'd be very, actually very, very simple to figure out. You could set up a claims office for people who tried through the GI Bill to borrow money and were denied. I mean, there are all sorts of like, I mean, and that's just the most, you know, meanest, strictest way of doing it. I mean, obviously, you know, I would think about something more expansive, but that's like the easy, that's the easy, easy thing that could be done right now if, you know, we actually had the political will. You know, I, I didn't include a plan for two reasons, okay? First reason was, uh, when I wrote that piece, and I hope this changed, but when I wrote that piece, you know, uh, reparations was, was a skit for Dave Chappelle. You know, it was, I mean, I'm talking about the chase for it, like the idea that it should even happen was something that immediately got, you know, uh, uh, laughed out of the room. You know, so I, I felt like in my, my, my primary job was to, I don't want to say make it respectable. Um, I really don't want to say that, you know, because I hate the idea that because it's in the Atlantic, you know, and I did then becomes respectable. How about, let's put it like this, um, expand the Overton window. <laughs> expand the things that are thought of as possible. So something that, you know, is thought of, uh, we, we have this idea within our politics that things that are radical are necessarily wrong and that all the wisdom lies at the center. Um, and, and what I wanted to do more than anything was sort of co combat that belief and, you know, make people take it seriously. And the second thing is, you know, as much as I'm interested in the material deprivations that come from reparations, I'm just as interested in uh, us evolving into a, a kind of society, and this is where, you know, I, I guess I can see some parallels here, where we don't fear our own history. You know, where we don't uh, uh, um, take credit for part of George Washington. <laughs> where we don't take credit for a part of Thomas Jefferson. You know, where patriotism isn't just like scarfing down hot dogs on, on the 4th of July. You know, we understand that like you don't, like heritage is not the right to just, you know, take credit for the things that make you look good and ignore all the things that make you look bad. You know, so I'm just as interested in that challenge as, as I am in the wealth argument. The first thing is the way reparations is, is, is often pictured is um, a debt that individual white citizens owe to individual black citizens. And I think this actually will get right to the core of what you're talking about. And, and that's the source of you know, all, all the objections that say, well, you know, my parents came here, or my great-great-grandparents or grandparents or whoever came here in 1920. What the hell? I didn't have anything to do with this. Um, I'm not white. You know, I didn't have anything to do with this. Uh, reparations is an injury claim leveled at the society itself, the, 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 the entire society. 
Um, no one escapes that. It's quite likely that, you know, in some sci-fi world, if reveries were ever passed in my lifetime, I, it would come out of my taxes too. That's important to recognize. That's because even as the demographics change, if you decide you want to be part of America, you inherit all of America. You don't just, you know, you know, you don't just inherit the parts of America that that, that are cool. I mean, and that that's the, the the really really crucial thing. You know, again, people say, well, you know, my, you know, I didn't, you know, my ancestors didn't own any slaves. You know, and my ancestors got here after slavery. Okay. The ancestors also didn't fight in the Revolutionary War. So how about you not celebrate the Fourth of July? How about we ban Fourth of July for you? You know what I mean? Um, the country that you're, the point is that the country that hopefully, you know, people want to be a part of. You know, the country that your ancestors, you know, came to. I guess it wasn't your ancestors, sorry. <laughs> your parents. <laughs> that your parents came to. It's unimaginable without enslavement. It's just not possible. Like, it just could not. There's no, you know, I was, talking, I was debating with this guy, and he said, imagine America in 1900 and, you know, Africans just got there. No, there's no America to imagine. Who's going to work the land? I mean, slavery happened for an actual reason. It didn't happen just because, you know, you know, white people were immoral or something like that. You know, anytime you have an abundance of land as you had in America, you know, and you need labor, well, slavery is a, is a system that often, you know, multiplies in such a condition. What I'm trying to say is that's uh, inseparable from the country that, you know, your parents wanted to come to. That's part of why the country exists in the first place. So the minute you decide that, you, that you're going to be part of that, you know, that's part of you. <laughs> you inherited that too. And so, um, Actually, you know, no matter how the demographics change in America, um, I'm confident of, of two things. The first thing is, if we do not begin to directly address history, nothing will change. And, and I, I just, I hate to be the, the Debbie Downer on that, but I mean, there's, there's all sorts of, uh, you know, um, theorizing out there that somehow we can get around, get, get away from that, somehow we can get around it, somehow we can, you know, not talk about it. And what that depends on is black people not acting crazy. In other words, as long as we can afford to not talk about it, we won't talk about it. And it may be that, you know, for the entirety of American history, we can afford not to talk about it. I'm prepared to, you know, hear that that actually might happen. But the fact of the matter is, if you are actually interested, as I am, in the ultimate vanquishing of white supremacy, which is our original sin, which is at the root of not just enslavement, which is at the root of the, you know, the destruction of Native American nations, if you're ultimately interested in that, you got to have a confrontation with history. And that's just not, you know, for white people only. That's for all of America. I write what I write, and that's cool. But I, 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 the, the reaction has actually been quite stunning. I mean, it really is. I mean, the level of reaction is nothing like what I ever expected. Um, yeah, it really depends on who's coming up to me, you know. Um, I think, and I, you know, just to be, you know, the, the, the crudest about it, um, black people come up to me and they just say, thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, I mean, that's, that's the major reaction I get. And I don't think it's like, like I think all African-Americans have in their head somewhere, even if they can't like lay out the math, even if they can't, you know, like, um, uh, uh, you know, even if they don't know all the historical facts, have a deep seated sense that they've been robbed. Mm -hmm. They just don't know how and by what, you know, but you know, you notice, you know, and I had like, you know, people tell me this. You know, a woman, you know, who, who uh, was in this caught up in this contract alone situation, and she goes over to her white co-workers home, and she sees all these nice things that they have. This woman's working a consistent job, working a butt off, husband working, you know, also. They're married. All the, you know, sort of, you know, ideas that, you know, we talk about or what, about what black people need to do in terms of culture, they're doing them. And yet she can't. She barely afford to live. What's going on? So in the back of her mind, she knows something's up. You know, and so I think for a lot of African Americans, if I may be so bold, it was, you know, like, oh my God, I wasn't crazy. <laughs> And I just want to say, like, there's something to that. Like, there's, there's, a, there's actually a boon in that, to not know you're crazy. I mean, that was the best thing, you know, about writing the article, because at the end, listen, I don't know if we're going to get reparations. I don't know if that's going to happen. You know, I don't expect it to happen in my lifetime, and I'm deeply skeptical that it would happen in my son's lifetime. But I can't be lied to, you see? That's, that's the thing. I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. I don't have to, you know, when, when people, you know, run through all of these sort of, you know, diversions to talk about what's going on in the black community, I can now understand them as diversions. And I don't even have to participate. I don't even have to go there. And that's like a relief because half the weight of racism is, am I crazy? You know? And being relieved of that, I think, is, 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 a, is a huge deal. Um, white people who approach me about the article, you know, those of them who liked it, um, <laughs> and there are a lot. And there are a lot. There, there are quite a few. There are many more than I thought. Um, their basic thing is, I didn't know. 
I didn't know. That's probably the most common reaction I get. It's, it's, it's just, I, you know, I didn't know. And I think um, that has a lot to do with how we talk about our history. That's a lot. And frankly, you know, I'm just, you know, being a lefty, I think it has a lot to do with how the, how the left talks about its history. You know, holding up, you know, Truman and FDR as these, you know, unassailable gods, you know, who never did anything wrong. Not really interrogating the actual history of how unemployment insurance was passed. Not really uh, interrogating the actual history of how Social Security was passed, how that was actually made possible. Not really, you know, interrogating the actual history of how the GI Bill, which every president in America stands up and says this is the greatest thing we ever did. It was written to exclude black people. I mean, this is just no, I mean, this is not even, you know, uh, Ira Katz Nelson in his book talks about this fear itself. Just one to Bancroft for what? That's the other thing. I mean, this information is not hidden in like secret journals somewhere. I mean, these are historians at, you know, really, really big universities. And for some reason, for some reason, perhaps something really essential to us, uh, you know, we're not reading them. And we don't, you know, really want to know. So um, as Baldwin said, you know, now you know. And to know is to act. You know, now you got to do something. That, 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 that really is the hard part right there.